And thank you for joining us once again on PM Express. In the last few days, since last week, since we got to know the details of our IMF program, we have been digesting it, breaking it down into this series of looking at the various sections of our economy and what the impact will be. Yesterday, we, look, we looked at the financial sector impact. Today, we, let's look at the program and what it will mean for labor for all of us, for workers in general. And so this is one thing that affects all of us in this country. And so let's isolate it a bit more. And I'm pretty sure you've heard bits and pieces of what the IMF program means for your wages, for your salaries, etc. But there are a few other things that we brought in just to give it a bit of more context before we sit down and have a conversation with representatives of labor. So let's get into it. One of the key things that will strike you when you read the uh, IMF program document, is this particular expression that was used in there that the wages of the public sector workers across this country will be calibrated to ensure a balance. But the key, I guess, fundamental elements that will become the, the source of, of that balancing act are interesting. The first one is bedding sharing. So you're recalibrating and calibrating the, the wages of public sector workers to ensure a balance between bedding sharing. So what does that mean when you say a balance between bedding sharing? I mean, between what they organize labor, the workers, the public sector, with the bedding that they are carrying and that of the rest of us or vis-a-vis -vis the government? Your question is there to answer. But also productivity. And that is important. That's a bedding sharing. It's a bit vague. What does that mean when it comes to bedding sharing? Is it um, the, the question of how much salaries government could give you? We'll come to what the third bit also highlights a bit more of this bedding sharing problem. But productivity for me is straightforward, right? I mean, wages must be dependent on how productive you are. In a private sector, it's a given that you're only paid what your worth is you're paid according to your worth and what you bring to the table and how productive you are often this has been a major conversation um you know in the public sector about measuring productivity and, and paying people according to this and so the imf document spells it out without ambiguity but it's about okay so how what what, what measurement are you going to use to measure this productivity is a key thing and then last one is an interesting one capacity to pay and in, in a time such as this capacity to pay is a very important point does that mean that if the government determines that it simply hasn't got a capacity to pay we're going to have a situation where wages will be negotiated and agreed but then it comes down to capacity to pay so these three things are fundamental and that is these will remain the basic the scope and the prism within which wages of the public sector workers will now be determined. So going into the tripartite committee meetings that we know will happen, uh, happen already, agreement and everything else in, in the next three years, when, when you sit around the table to talk, bedding sharing, let's look at that, let's look at productivity, let's look at capacity to pay, and that will determine it. So these are very important points indeed to consider uh, going forward. And then we know the number is huge, 700,000 um, public sector workers in all, and they carry a significant part of the what we know to be the costs on the budget, right? And this includes, as you may know by now, doctors, teachers, nurses, and others. And they are all in this particular number that we talk about, 700. And then you break it down even more, looking at the document that we've been reading. And this bit here is important because in that document, the government has already committed to the to limit wage increases in hiring. And the, the estimation is that that will save us 0.5% of GDP. And so that is, that is key, limiting wage increases and hiring. What does that mean if you're limiting wage increases? Is it you're, you are slowing down the rate of increase? Or you are saying, for example, that you're keeping the wages the same? Well, it doesn't say that. There's no wage freeze. There's no employment freeze. You are limiting it. So you're not doing as much as you would in normal times. And that lends itself to a lot of interpretation indeed. But that's a key thing to focus on also for us. 
But the TUC, we know, has already been talking about this. You know, right? They make, make the point government had agreed to, to this deal and they didn't consult them. Another point that they have talked about is that they already agreed 4% and 5% base pay. And that, that increase in 2021 was agreed based on the principle that government will continue to hire and employ young people into the public service. And so when they talk about limiting hiring, listen, we already have a deal in place that you, you're going to, you know, agree to 4 and 7%, but you're going to employ more people. So then that becomes, I guess, some form of a conflict that needs to be resolved. And then you look at the wage bill in billions, and you see the wage bill has been climbing consistently. And you look at the 2023, the budget is estimated we're going to be spending 44.99 billion uh, CDs just paying um, salaries. And if you look at the share of the wage bill as against pay interest, those two line items have always taken up almost everything that we generate in this country. Uh, per the revenues that you know the country is able to make through taxes and etc so that is huge and you see the consistent climb in in the in the wage the only time that it dropped which is interesting in in 2017 i don't know what happened there but there's an interesting drop there but other than that this has been climbing and climbing and climbing uh, over the years and then you look at the uh, compensation of employees between this period as i suppose if you look compared to the a percentage of GDP, and you're looking at that huge figure there of 5.9 percent. It's reduced in 2023 because the economy is in hard times. But if you come to 2021, it was 7.1 percent. So again, this is important. Government is going to factor all this in in the competitions going forward. But in addition to the limiting of wage, the uh, the, the uh, wage increases and hiring, another thing that we know will affect workers is the tax measures and the revenue measures that the program is proposing, right? Not even proposing, that government has agreed to implement as part of the IMF program. One is increasing of VAT rate from 12.5% to 15%, revision of the income-based tax, reform of the e-levy, um, which we've seen already that, that, you know, government is not thinking about what to do. Government has already gone to parliament to reduce um, the rate revision of the excise taxes and removal of VAT exemptions are all, you know, that will come into play. Mainly, increasing VAT will affect a lot of workers. Also, revision of the income tax base will also affect workers, whilst the, the limitations are placed on wages and hiring. Now, but there's also the question about real incomes. While all this is happening, and workers are going to be taken ahead as their salaries are recalibrated, right? We know that inflation is eating away a significant part of your income. So if you look at the, the Ghana Statistical Service, right, they talk about if you earn one, 118 CDs, for example, based on the, the current economic circumstances and inflation largely, your real income is just 172.22 CDs. That is how much you have um, in, you know, to, to spend. And the value loss is that. The real income is 245.78 uh, CDs, right? So this is how much you actually you have to spend this is already gone, right, it, over, the, over the year because of mainly inflation. If you earn 2,500, this is gone. This is how much you actually have in your pocket to spend, 1,525. And so, yes, your, your, work, your employers will pay you this and hit your account, but in terms of what that money can buy, it can only buy this worth of goods and services if you, you do want to spend on that. And if you are in this bracket, that's how significant it is in terms of, you know, what you've lost already, taking home 33,850. So workers are caught in a fix here. And remember, overwhelming majority of these workers are in, in this line bracket here, the 2,500 bracket, overwhelming majority. Just a tiny fraction of them you find here. The significant number are in this as well. So it tells you a big story of what the real incomes are in this particular country at this time. And cumulatively, if you do the cumulative tax, you know, according to the GRA, you pay significantly over the period uh, as, you, as you graduate into the certain brackets also. So people are having to pay the taxes and the impact is very, very obvious. What has been organized labor's assessment of this document? When I return from the break, we will get them to give us a sense of what they are making of the IMF program, the details that I've just you know, enumerated for you, and then going forward, really, this next three years, where could there possibly be 
a, a meeting point where both government, uh, labor, possibly the IMF, and IMF has sent the team here to ensure that the program is executed, a certain balance will have to be reached. Other than that, as Labour have already told us, there is going to be a tag of war. Stay with me after this. We'll get to hear from Labour on, on the details of the programme as it relates to them. And thanks for staying with us here on PM Express. Joining me right now for a conversation is the Vice President of NAGRAD, the National Association of Graduate Teachers, Mr. Jacob Anaba. Mr. Anaba, thanks for time here on PM Express. Also joining me tonight for a conversation uh, is Professor Ransford Jampo. You know him. He is a is a, the secretary of the UTAC at the University of Ghana. And as you know him, he's a, he's a senior lecturer there at the University of Ghana as well. And he has uh, very strong views on this, representing the Universities Association of Ghana, UTAG, on the campus of University of Ghana, a secretary. Also joining us is Dr. David Tinkran Chum. And, and Dr. David Tinkran Chum is the general secretary of the Ghana Registered Nurses Association. Um, and it's important to you know, have all the sectors. We have education represented, but we also have the health sector represented uh, for a conversation such as this, as far as it relates to labor. And then also joining us is uh, Austin Gamer, who is a labor consultant, has been a minister uh, for employment before, and has seen you know, many IMF programs in the past and how labor has always been at the heart of the programs that the IMF and government had agreed upon. And so thankfully he joins us for a conversation as well. I mean, Dr. Tinkran Chum, let me start with you on this. So first off, give me your initial assessment of the IMF program document as it relates to labor, specifically the registered nurses and Midwest Association of which you are the, the general secretary. You read it, Good news for you. <laughs> good evening, my brother. Good evening to your viewers. And uh, good evening to Papa Gave and my senior comrades on, on the call. It's certainly not a good news. And as you are aware, any time that there is an austerity measure, the first point of call is labor. Uh, but when there is any booty to be shared, labor is virtually forgotten. But we are not perturbed by whatever is laid out in the IMF uh, program. We know that the government is very much aware that the recent hikes in inflation has certainly eroded whatever gains that we made during the last negotiations. And they should brace themselves for a possible showdown if any attempt is made to, as it were, reduce salaries of workers. I know that will not happen. No government will ever do that, and they are very much aware. But for now, we are observing. Mm. Spe specifically, I, I want to bring you other colleagues. Now, come to you for the specific so But let me start with uh, Jacob Annabelle on this. You said they will not reduce salaries. That, in fact, is not in the document. What is in the document, Mr. Anabado, is an agreement with government to limit wage increases. We'll talk about the hiring bit shortly, but to limit wage increases. Now, when you read that, you've, you're in labor, so you, you represent a, a significant group. What is your understanding when the government agrees in the IMF document to limit wage increases? Thank you, Ivan. Um, greetings to your cherished viewers. Uh, my understanding um, is that governments will not uh, increase the or wages above a certain uh, threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, if you recall, uh, this year we went to the table with 60%, and government had to uh, negotiate, and uh, we agreed on 30%. And that was uh, actually uh, sharing the burden that government have at the time. So um, looking at what is happening now, the, uh, the inflation, the, our salaries have been eroded more than half. Um, increment in uh, utilities, it has taken more than a quarter of our salary. We may go to the table for more than the 60% we went this year. So if government is thinking of uh, limiting wages, then it means that government is thinking of something less than uh, 30%. Okay, so that's your understanding. I mean, if I have uh, Professor Jampo on the line, uh, 
Okay, we'll join him pretty shortly. Okay, so let me circle back to Dr. Tinkram Chum. So you, you've heard your colleague uh, from NAGRA. This is his understanding, nothing above a 30%. What's your understanding when government says there's a commitment now in the next three years to limit wage increases? Uh, certainly, uh, it, my understanding is not different from what he has espoused. Okay. But um, as I indicated earlier on, I was present in the, in the recent negotiations and uh, Labour had to make a lot of concessions because of the same uh, adjective of sharing the burden. We have shared enough burden and we think that is the time for government to show some commitment if he wants productivity as spelled out in the document to go up because a demotivated workforce will certainly impact adversely on productivity. So uh, my understanding is not different, but uh, when we get to the bridge, we shall cross it. We want to send a very strong signal to government. As much as we want to share the burden, we have already shared enough, and it's up to them to also show a certain level of commitment if they want productivity to show up so that we can grow the economy out of these uh, quagmire that we have, uh, we find ourselves. Okay, but, but both of you again, starting with you, Mr. Tinkran Chum. So you, you all agree that limiting wage increases, in essence, you're not going to get what you intend to ask for and government can't go beyond a certain threshold. Um, you know, the, the suggestion there uh, by Jacob Anaba is nothing above 30 percent. I mean, but to you again, Mr. Tinkran Chum, it, it really, isn't that a reflection of where we are in the economy right now and that it just... Um, a matter of course. This is what you can expect if you are an IMF program that wages will definitely be curtailed. I mean, increasing wages will be curtailed. This was expected, was it not? I mean, and, and you, this is not something that, surprised, that surprises you, that is in the document. Yeah, I'm not surprised we have that in a document, especially when we are in an austerity measure of exactly. a sort. But as I recounted earlier on, why should labor be the first point of call when it comes to burden sharing, because because the you take, investor community because because the argument is and as, as I showed the evidence shows that you take almost everything that we make as a country in addition to of course the interest that we pay those two line items alone um, leaves us with very little and that's why you are always obviously one of the places to go <laughs> if you want to cut. Okay, let me let me let me show government where they can go to show up the economy. And despite the fact that we have an IMF program, we can still have a homegrown program that will rake in a lot of revenue, mm -hmm. which will enable government to increase salaries to appreciable levels. Now, don't forget that as of 2020, the Oil revenues that came to this country was about $31.22 billion. What gov came to government was $6.55 billion. Now, it tells you that our percentage is about 21%. If you strike the percentage, the entire revenue, according to PIAC, in 2020 was, or 2022, was 21.22 billion. And what came to government was $6.55 billion. Now, if you renegotiate these deals, which we have to do, there's a template. All right? If we don't need to go far, uh, Magufuri, all right? When he came to power in 2016, 2017, he renegotiated all deals. He calls his parliament to enact the necessary provisions, two provisions to be specific, and he had to renegotiate oil and gas contracts that were negotiated even before he came to office. We need to be very radical as a country if we want to maximize whatever uh, resources that we have. We cannot just allow people to siphon our extractive industry to the detriment of the citizens. So I'm saying that if we double our interests only in the three fields that we have, all right, 
we shall move to over 13 billion dollars. We are going for a pittance of three billion dollars with all these uh, uh, complex uh, austerity measures. So governments shouldn't only look at labor, they must also look at other sectors. For instance, illicit financial flow out of this country is so huge. Multilateral companies that are refusing to pay taxes that they are supposed to pay. So you see, if, if we don't take radical decisions as a country, we will always go a begging. And if we want to develop this country, look, when China was trying to advance some loan to Magufuri, he said, no, there are resources in his country. And just by what I have told you, he raked in a lot of revenue and he didn't go for loans to develop that country. Mm. So we need to look at all the gold proceeds. How much accrues to the country? 5.1 billion 2021, 6.3 billion 2022. How much came to government? So we need to be very intentional as a people. We don't want Niger Delta to happen in this country. Yeah. And the investment, investment, investor community should get to understand that their investment is as safe when the country is at is at peace. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I want to I want to bring in uh, Mr. Gamet. Mr. Gamet, so D David Tinkrenchum, um, Mr. Anaba, all make that point, and as we just illustrated, there are other areas that government should focus. But if you consider that labor alone, the burden in the budget is forty four point nine nine billion, and if you take out interest, that's a you know the biggest chunk of everything else. It's inevitable, isn't it? that in times like this, the IMF and government will have an agreement that definitely includes labor. This is fair, is it not? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to my colleagues there. Well, it may sound uh, to, be, to be nice, but uh, it's a real bedding some stone that should be hung on the necks of the people of Ghana, including working people. So clearly something ought to be done about it to reduce the bedding that we are being called upon to share in diverse ways. And there's always a transition for everything. This one too should have a transition. And I think that it's very important that uh, government acknowledge the need to quickly have a round table conversation. I'm not talking about debate and argument and endless kind of partisan thing we have uh, imported upon ourselves. All we need to do is to have a simple conversation, having in mind that we are all stakeholders in this thing. We don't need this time a kind of uh, powerful people in power. That's not what we need. We all have to be sober, be candid with each other, and share the bedding properly, like was done in 2015. You know, and so I think that it's not too late. I mean, but, but, but Mr. Gamme, Mr. Gamme, sorry, you, you say that, but I need to ask, what's the point of that sitting down around the table? Because this is a deal that has been signed and sealed and delivered. The government cannot go back to his word. Government has committed to save the GDP from, from GDP 0.5% from limiting wage increases and hiring already. So that's a hard number. They can't change. And that is directed to labor. So what will the meeting around the table with Labour, what would I achieve when it's inevitable now, it's, it's done? Well, there are several other things that can be done. Indeed, we have a workforce, um, just about 700,000, but in which sectors of the economy? We have to look at those areas where we have excesses, as have been you know, said by many people already, but we can prune down some of those uh, uh, numbers, uh, whether it's in the seat of government, uh, wherever it may be, we have to prune them down. Then all of us must agree that corruption in any form or shape will have to be a thing of the past. So that whatever money that accrues to the nation should go into the kitty, enable the Ministry of Finance and those who must manage, manage prudently then we will then that's probably betting sharing but if we know that money is being used for other purpose 
than what is intended for, to, to be used for, then there's nothing to be shared. You know, I negotiate for the nurses myself uh, and many other uh, union leaders, and, and therefore it's, it's a, a real thing that is saying there, if you become critical and people could no longer will no longer be able to hold their horses to get out of the stable. And the way to deal with it is simply this. According to our labor law, it is proper for government to call at least labor properly to a, a tripartite meeting, perhaps to be chaired by the president himself or vice president on this occasion, where so we discuss thoroughly issue, issues relating to the economy and the importance of the economy as far as labor is concerned. If that is done, I can assure you, then the bedding sharing becomes a real bedding sharing because the words that are being used, limiting, calibration, they are all a bit vague and loose, you know, in, in many ways. And so we need, we don't need to stay in yesterday. Any form of anachronistic thing must be put to the, you know, back banner. We need to move everything to the front banner and all of us have a clean conversation and stop playing games with with power, power now. Mm. We don't need power-based situations. Yeah, I mean, Mr. Anaba, another specific in the document that we've just been detailing is that your salaries would now be calibrated and to ensure a balance between productivity, capacity to pay and bedding sharing. We've talked a lot about the bedding sharing bit. I want to focus on the other bit, which is capacity to pay. I mean, we'll come to the productivity. Capacity to pay. Isn't that fundamental at this time? I mean, I, should I expect that from Nagra's point of view, going into next year, you will have expectations of asking for uh, another raise in spite of what you got this year already? Yeah. Uh, if you recall, in 2021, we were given 4%. Yes. 2022, 7%. Yes. This year, we went for 60 or more, and we are giving 30%. Yes. And we looked at the capacity to pay, and we agreed with government to give us those percentages. This year, when we go to the table, we are also going to look at the capacity to pay. Like my brother rightly said, when we were calling for government to sit with us before going to uh, IMF, they never did. We needed to sit down so that we could make certain proposal that could help government overcome some of these economic difficulties. Government never sat down with organized labor. They have gone to IMF and they are back with a paper. We are not part of that paper. What we know is that we are going to work hard as Ghanaian workers, produce very highly, and we should be paid what is due us so that we can take care of our families. But, 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 aren't, you already, but aren't you already being paid what is due you? You have a 30% raise in salary. I can bet you many people <laughs> in the private sector haven't got 30% raise this year. I, I, I know that for certain. But you have 30% hey, raise man, you, in salary this year. And you are, you, 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 you are, you are gobbling up 44.99% uh, 44.99 billion CDs. In, a, in times like this, you are already being paid. Evans, you said that inflation has taken almost half of our salary. That's true. So the real value is not what you are mentioning. Apart from that, look at the tariff uh, rise. Mm. Electricity has gone up by 49% or so. Electricity alone, rent. <laughs> so you can imagine the real amount that the workers are taking home. Uh, workers are really suffering. In, so, in fact, some of us wonder how we are able to make it by the end of the month. It is a real suffering situation we are, we are talking about. So this rise in pay has not done any uh, significant difference in our lives. It has not, because immediately we, we had that rise, uh, uh, electricity comp uh, company increased their, this thing by 30%, their rate by 30%. Lorry first went up, almost everything. So as we speak, our real salaries are less than what you mentioned on, this, uh, on the set. Oh, I see. Very well. I, I see. I mean, Dr. Tinkran Chum, um, 
give me a sense of what the, what the picture is going forward here with, with the Labour. You've already agreed your 30% this year. You had cola that was there before, which has been factored into it now. Uh, what is the next, when, when do you next begin to have conversations around salary for next year? Yeah, I think um, we, we should be able to set a government to negotiate for uh, next year's salary. Um, you know, these years are like delayed because, you know, according to the finance, uh, Financial Management Act, um, salaries for the ensuing year should be negotiated in April, at least by, by close of April. Yeah. All right. So um, the 30% that you're talking about was negotiated far, you know, uh, uh, away from the time that it ought to be negotiated. So I believe that next year, early next year, we have to sit down with government to uh, uh, negotiate. But uh, even when you say that we were giving 30%, 30% of what? That is what matters. Okay, the, the basic salaries of workers is nothing to write home about. So if they give you 30% of 500 Ghana cities, 30% of 1,000 Ghana cities, how, how, how much does it accrue to you in real terms? All right, so you may hear the figure, 30%. We went for 60%. So if you are given 30% at the time that inflation was 50%, it means that you're already in the negatives of 20 because <laughs> the vision has taken everything that uh, you have virtually negotiated for. So I think that next year we will we'll sit with government, not even next year, some of us, uh, some of the unions, for instance, my union, uh, uh, our condition of service has expired and we want to sit down with government this year to negotiate for better condition of service for nurses and midwives. So you are very much aware how nurses and uh, uh, other healthcare professionals are leaving the country in groups, all right? Government must avert its mind to this, that people are leaving. What do you do? You have a program of IMF before you. You need to prioritize, all right? And show to IMF. And that is why my brother was talking about that. We never imputed into the conversation, okay? As far as the IMF decision was, was concerned, government went, negotiated the IMF, and is back with a paper like what my brother said. So as far as we are concerned, we are very reasonable people. We know that the country is going through a lot of difficulties, but we will not do that at the expense of the ordinary worker. Whatever is due the workers, we shall make such demands of government. You, you, said, you said that your conditions of service had expired. When did it expire? It expired in 2020. Uh, yeah, 2022. Yeah, we negotiated it in 2020 and it has expired in 2022 so okay. it has expired so so um, you're expecting it expired to, last year oh last year so you're expecting this year to sit and renegotiate this exactly okay and and now when it expired last year the IMF program had not been concluded now it has been concluded the government has a tight you know uh, prescription to 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 play with here government has committed to save 0.5 percent of gdp from limiting your wages and, and hiring, especially because you're in the in your health sector also. Do you accept that these negotiations that you're going to go into over your expired conditions of service will largely be dictated by the what government has already agreed with the IMF? Do you accept that as a reality? Well, that's a reality. That is why we are also giving options to government. All right? And as I alluded earlier on, we need to think outside the box. And we need to be very proactive as a country. You see, it, 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 it saddens me because this extractive industry, it's not like the oil will be there for forever. So if you continue to take this pittance, a time will come, the oil will be exhausted. And what will accrue to the country? Yeah, so I mean, we need what, to. What, 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 you, what you say may be true, but it, it can't happen in a year. Uh, so you still have to contend with the next three years IMF program and what, what, it, what its prescriptions are. I showed you a template in Tanzania yeah. where Dr. John Pombe Joseph Magufuli, within six months, caused the parliament of Tanzania to pass two bills that saw the renegotiation of oil and gas. It can be done. Mm. What is required of is the political will. And my brother, I'm saying that if we don't do some of these things 
and and curtail some of these imperialist tactics, we will be there. Because look, growing agriculture, yes, we're talking about growing food, whatever. Look, agriculture alone cannot push our GDP to where we want it to go. So we need to look at these areas and diversify. When we talk about diversification of the economy, these issues must be looked at. Mm. So Evans, I'm saying that this is a very good intellectual discourse. We are not just shouting as labor. We have given options even before the domestic death exchange program. Labor gave cogent suggestions to government. Yeah. All right. All these things are there. And I believe that if government factor it into the IMF program, we'll be able to make some headway. I am very much convinced that the prospect of this country is good, but we need leaders who have the balls, who will take the bull by the horn and, and, and decide or take the good decisions. If otherwise, we are in trouble. I okay. cannot fathom why gold proceeds that comes to the country in terms of receipt should be this low. Let, so let the youth of this country is not asking for just constitutional amendment and the rest of it. We want government to sit down with the investor community to look at these major uh, uh, issues. Yeah. All right. I know that it's not going to be easy. It's not as, as simple I, as I'm I mean, I mean, in the, talking about I mean, it. I, 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 hear, I hear you on the alternatives, and I want to bring in Professor Ransford Jampo into the conversation. He just joined us on the phone. I hear you on the alternatives, and, and Professor Jampo himself had articulated saying that there are alternatives for, for government. But um, and Prof, thanks for joining us uh, briefly on phone. I, I need to ask you on the, on the back of what we've just heard there from your colleagues about the alternatives and government needs to you know, look at other areas and not just focus on labor. In the IMF document, and many say rightly so, the IMF, the government has agreed with the IMF that henceforth in calibrating your salaries, the productivity question must be one of three pillars around which your salaries are calibrated and, and determined, that you, you accept going forward, that in the midst of this economic hardship, as you ask for equal bedding sharing, the suggestion that labor sometimes hasn't been as productive but has demanded a lot more salary, 44 billion, as we've just been talking about, is even more important now. And labor themselves must take the initiative to get government to, to sort of be, you know, base the salaries on productivity. Do you accept that that should be central now going forward and we must see no, real measures? No, I, I do not even accept that. You don't? Why should it, why should it, why should they always be targeting labor? It is true. I mean, in every sane economy, um, compensation should be linked to productivity. But if that is the case, then this should be a cause board. The politicians, what do they do? to end the amount of salaries and emoluments and allowances that they get. Can you compare their productivity, what they do to the productivity of the ordinary labor? I mean, <laughs> look, if we want to do that, then let it be a cause board. You don't see, I see a party communicator who just got down to school, hasn't worked before, and his first paycheck was given to him or her, simply because he joined the political party in the lead-up to the electionary campaign and fought for the party. The party won, and so he's, given a, he's been given a new aid. He grows free to well. He's, he's been given a mountain. He's enjoying huge allowances and fast salaries, and in the next two, three years, he's building huge mansions at the expense of the state. What do they do to get themselves entitled to those allowances and incentives and conditions of services and salaries. Is it productivity? So we reward people who, who, who do nothing and, um, and get a lot of resources in terms of salary. And then those who toil, those who do their toil, um, we've been able to finance the enjoyment and the entertainment and the luxuries and luxuries of politicians. We always want to continue to inflict austerity measures on them. I mean, that is not fair. You see, that's how come this particular conditionality, in my view, will not fly. The argument has been made. I'm sure my colleagues have made that the point. Yesterday, on your program, I think I made the point again. You see, every IMF um, conditionality would inflict some austerity measures on the people. 
whether you like it or not. Yesterday, I told you that these things, this has been the case since the introduction and implementation of the structural adjustment program. The structural adjustment program, if you look at uh, all over um, countries that implemented it, there were rampant social and political backlash that led to attempted coups, and in some countries, there were coups that were staged. It brought a lot of hardship to people, and people rebelled, rejected it. This forced those who introduced it to introduce, to bring about the structural adjustment, um, structural adjustment um, uh, implementation review initiative. And that was a program that was aimed at now bringing on board the views of those who are affected by the implementation of the program so that um, they will dialogue to ensure that the impact of the program will be more tolerable on the ordinary people. So the point is, we must learn from past mistakes. You implemented and introduced austerity measures without consulting, and you can see that that was even in a military era. And then later, you are forced to bring about the views of other people, influential, identifiable people, and to society to bear on the program so that the impact is more tolerable and minimized. Now we are in democratic regime. It appears that this particular government is very deficient in the canons of good governance, particularly in the area of participatory governance. When we talk about participatory governance, essentially we are saying that decision making that are likely to affect a certain group of people must be taken with prior consultation and input from those people. And then you are going to ask take a decision that is likely to easily impact on labor. And you don't think you have to consult them. You, are, you rather want to take um, that decision and then labor, labor would force you to then sit down to review the decisions with them. I think it is not a, um, a show of, 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 of good government. And um, this is a government that prides um, itself in um, governing the country better than all other regimes. And I don't think that that's, that that's the way to go. And so the point is this. Sacrifices will have to be made. Um, if sacrifices will have to be made, we all must need to sacrifice. The situation where this mm. particular regime believes that labor, poor people, should be the ones sacrificing, while they would continue to enjoy, is never going to work. Mm. Okay, it, it is never going to work. And so like yesterday, like I said, if that is the route they want to go, then they should raise themselves for a major tag of war. Mm. And we are prepared to do that because, see, there's been expiration of conditions of service that will have to be renegotiated. Um, previous years, governments have signed various MOUs with labor um, to increase their um, salaries and uh, certain allowances. These are all supposed. To, these are all expected to be implemented this year and years beyond. And so you cannot go sign such agreement and then simply you you simply come and tell us that the IMF says um, because they have signed a certain agreement with us, you cannot carry out the MOE or MOU that you have signed with Labour. That is not going to mm. work. Well. Besides, we have you see besides some of the recommendations of the IMF themselves, they are problematic. They don't show that the IMF itself means well for, for us. And mm. then they also don't show that the government of the day itself also wants to sacrifice. I've always argued that, look, if the IMF means well, the IMF itself is headed by people who come from countries that believe in small-sized government. Why were they not able to tell us that, look, things are hard and so downsize, reduce the number of your ministers, downsize your government. Why were they not able to tell it? Yeah, I mean, I mean pro pro Professor Jampo, I mean, that you, that, that, they that, wouldn't I, want to sacrifice. Why didn't the IMF tell us this? You see, what they are doing is mm. just a deliberate and surreptitious effort aimed at perpetuating the cycle of African dependency on the West. That's what they are doing. Well, I there mean, so I, as, as we speak, as we speak now, uh, Professor Jump, as we speak now, the document. Um, as I've always already, already uh, pointed to, has not been been signed. It's it's the it's too late now, I guess. I mean, and and I want to bring in um, as we wrap up, 
Mr. Osingame, isn't this, you've been there before when uh, previous IMF programs have come around. Because this program has now been sealed, many will say it's too late already now. Um, you can't change what has already been agreed. So if you can't change what has already been agreed, and you hear Labour already say, the terms we've heard, we are going to oppose it. There's going to be a tug of war. We need harmony in the next three years if we want to bring this economy back on track. What can government and Labour do now to achieve that harmony in the midst of the fact that, you know, this deal has already been agreed? Um, I can hear you. If you, can, if you can unmute for me, please. Yeah, sorry. I can hear you. Agreement has been reached with the IMF, all right. But it's not too late. They have to call a national tripartite meeting if they don't want to do it with other stakeholders, such as civil society, such as um, uh, other political parties, they should do it with Labour because you can come under the tripartite uh, committee uh, under section 113 of the Labour Act and have a thorough conversation about the importance of the economy and how it affects. Yeah, I, asked, I, asked, you, I asked you earlier, what was the, the point of that conversation? Government is the one that is in control of all the macroeconomic indicators. Mm -hmm. The micro, we can have some discussion. Therefore, what, if you are coming to negotiate and you say, look, we don't have the capacity, then we talk about, can we have some concession on the tax threshold, for example? Two, what about certain costs that are all escalating day in, day out, such as we have agreed to increase utilities every quarter, can people withstand it? Can we suspend some? What else can be done is, is subject to conversation by the parties. Well, all, all, the things, all the things you've mentioned, just to point out, have all already been agreed by the IMF. Utility tariffs will be adjusted regularly once they do. Um, fuel will also go up now according to inflation and the exchange rate. All these already agreed. The government can't touch it now. Can't touch it at the appropriate time. We, we, the way that are being used, tag of war, is that is that what we want? We don't want tag of war. We don't want clashes. I don't think that it is proper at this point in time to have a very rigid society where there will be tag of war. All we need is peace. To relax ourselves, not to impose some hypertension upon us. All we need to do is to have a good conversation. Some of the things can be the calibration. This is the time for the calibration, rather. Calibration would enable certain adjustments to be made to bring about calibration. That is the proper professional meaning and its impact, not calibration in the political sense of it. No. Okay. I uh, think that something can be done about it. Well, I'm grateful uh, that you join us with your thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for your time on PM Express on this uh, very important conversation on the IMF and what it means for Labour. Uh, Jacob Anaba with Nagrat and uh, Professor Jampo joins us briefly on the phone. Or Singama, you just had there. And of course, the uh, General Secretary of the GRNA. Uh, I'm grateful. This affects all of us. At least we, we have a sense of where this is going to go. A call for a sit down. We'll see where the government takes that. Thank you.